Euro Dipcon champ repeats. Face-to-face -face action reheats. And every Ewok foe retreats. I'm David Hood of the Diplomacy Broadcast Network, and this is Deadline, DBN's monthly news program. Dateline, September 2021. For our feature story, what does it actually mean to win a game of diplomacy? 18 center, surely, but is that goal realistic? And if not, why do we play a game that's so hard to win, and what can we do about it? If you have never soloed a game before, what will it take for you to go for it and succeed? We'll discuss all these aspects of solo wins and more with a panel of experienced diplomacy veterans later in the program. But first, a look at headlines from around the world of diplomacy. The 2021 European Face-to-Face -face Championships, the Euro Dipcon, is in the books, and Russian Alex Lebedev has pulled off the hard-to-do repeat as champion after winning the event also in 2020. The tournament was held in the Republic of San Marino, which was also the site of the 2015 Euro Dipcon. Alex bested a top board consisting of René Van Rugen, Vincent Roulet, Daniele Bellardinelli, Philippe Weissert, Davide Cleopadre, Steve Persinini, and Cyril Savant. In other tournament news, the 2021 Weasel Mood in Chicago just completed a two-round virtual event on September 4th. Michigan hobbyist Russ Dennis has posted his first ever tournament victory. Russ, who's known online as Umble the Heap, topped both of his boards, besting top-notch competition in the process. Rounding out the top three were Chicago Club Weasels Christian Brown and Sabi Ahuja, both achieving their own personal bests. Catch the full coverage of this event right here on this very YouTube channel. Things are hopping within the Nexus diplomacy community. Instead of you having to put up with my usual blather about all this, let's hear Nexus news directly from one of its moderators and also, as I just mentioned, third place finisher at the recent Weasel Moot, Chicago diplomacy player Sabi Ahuja. Sabi, welcome to the show. Tell us hey. a little bit about yourself, if you would, please. Um, hi, I'm Sabi. I'm from Chicago. I am an accountant, and I started playing diplomacy this year, actually. How did I, you get into it? I got into it from my friend Evan. He introduced it to my friend's group, and it kind of went crazy for us. And then I wanted more games, and then he suggested me Nexus. Well, speaking of which, our viewers probably already know what Nexus is, but how about just a brief description of what it is and how you got involved as a moderator? Yes. Uh, Nexus is a Discord server. It is devoted completely to every type of variant for diplomacy. So we have stuff like Gunboat and Speedboat, which is a live five-minute turn Gunboat, as well as Press, and as well as one-on-one -on -one variants like Cold War, and then we're soon going to be adding uh, France versus Austria and other variants like Ancient Med or whatnot. So I know that Nexus has some leagues and tournaments and events like that. Tell, tell me what what's in business right now in terms of open for business and how would someone get involved in Nexus on these various events? Yes. Right now we have just started Cold War as a the Cold War tournament, which is a one-on-one -on -one tournament with between NATO and USSR, and we're about, we're putting up the finishing touches for our season season seven of our full press lead, uh, tournament. So that will be a tournament directed by our DBO Riaz. Oh he has taken charge of that, and that should be ready by time of October is when we should have it up and running. And we're also starting our gunboat tournament by December, by winter, I would say. Along with all those, while we're waiting in between tournaments, we have started leagues. Um, we have started our gunboat league, which is a 24-hour turn gunboat games that go on every two weeks. We also have our speedboat league as well, which is every two months we have a new season. And players play the live gunboat act 
games as well as we just started our press league which is every two weeks we have new games coming up where it's not anonymous 24-hour turns on different like websites like backstabber or web dip or v dip as well and yeah we have a lot coming on as well as we're expanding our arsenal of games we're going to expand to nexus variants which is a server that we're in partnership with where we're going to be having tournaments for seven zeus or ancient med or um as well as the one-on-one one which is the france versus austria so how would one get involved in Nexus? If they're hearing about this, it sounds like a lot. How, how does someone get involved in it sort of from the beginning? Um, so you just honestly would just have to like join the server and just interact with the groups. We're a very talkative bunch. And once you start talking to people, you realize there's like all of the leagues and tournaments are open to anyone of any skill level. You don't have to be an expert. You don't also have to be scared that you're a newbie that you're being taken advantage of it's just a very open and positive space where people love to give advice on how to do different things and how to play differently all right well you know when you say server you mean server on discord yes and and we're gonna we're gonna put at the bottom of this show we'll have a link for someone to ask for an invite to the server so that would be the first step yes would be joining Once they get in there, if they're confused, because people like me get confused easily on Discord, how would one, once you get in there, what would be a good place to start? Is there a a particular announcements section within that Discord server, or should they reach out to somebody in particular? Uh, Well, we have our roles bot, as well as ambassadors who will be welcoming people as they join the server, telling them about different leagues and different tournaments that we're having on going on right there. As well as I would say for someone who just joined, I would suggest trying out the leagues first to like get your like foot in the water, I guess. So you get yourself acquainted on how different metas and how the play style is. I would suggest if you're more of a gunboat player to try out the gunboat turn league, which is a lot easier on newbies I've heard from others as well as our press league which has a very high number of new players who are in there who are trying to get themselves acquainted and get practices in for the tournament so yeah well Sabid could give us any final thoughts you might have about why someone should just jump into Nexus feet first honestly it's a great welcoming space it was what made me fall in love more with diplomacy actually i made a lot of friends out of it and then like it helped me become a better player by interacting especially after games when we have the after game action report so like a lot of like post game talking about what i should have done differently or what other people should have done differently and learning different people's viewpoints on how they play has helped me expand my way of playing i think well, that's great to hear, and it's great to have you on the show. Thank you. Haven't you always wondered what would happen if you asked a quantum computer to play diplomacy? No doubt your answer is yes. And no doubt you've also always wanted to read an article about game theory, which uses an illustration about potential English and French moves on a diplomacy board to explain the concept of a Nash equilibrium. Well, physics and or computer science geeks out there, PhD hopeful Lewis Tesler at McCara University in Sydney, New South Wales, has written a paper on these very subjects, of which I can follow enough to know that I cannot follow it. No, no, I mean it. It's too many equations with too much high-level mathematical notation. It makes my brain hurt. Please, some of y'all science folk out there, go read the paper at the link below and then explain it to the rest of us. Or don't. Whichever choice maximizes your own game theory outcomes. The diplomacy hobby is chock full these days in terms of opportunities to participate in online or virtual face-to-face league play. In addition to the various Nexus leagues you heard about from Sabi, there are opportunities in the Virtual Diplomacy League, the French Language League, and the Tour of Britain. As you probably already know, the Diplomacy Broadcast Network offers full coverage for all of this league action, 
in its monthly league night broadcast. The most recent edition, a link to which is below, covered VDL games played on August 21st, as well as several games from the French Language League. After that set of games, British player Michaelis Kamarites continues to lead the Virtual Diplomacy League, with fellow British resident Saren Kwok now in second, and Vermont's Morgante Pell taking the third position. The Tour of Britain continues on September 11th and 12th, with games scheduled each day, as it holds its third weekend of four total planned for the 2021 Tour of Britain season. To join in these tour games or to prepare to participate in the November games, please follow the link below for the VWDC Discord server, then choose the Tour of Britain role, and get ready to rumble! Even with COVID upticks in various parts of the world of diplomacy, face-to-face -face play has still been taking place under appropriate circumstances with the necessary safeguards. The Armada Group in the Denver, Colorado area saw a Turkish solo by Iber Kondral in its August 21st game, which took place in Highlands Ranch, Colorado. The Minnesota Diplomacy Club has its next game scheduled for noon on September 18th at the Fantasy Flight Game Center in Rollsville. See the link below provided in the description field. In addition, live face-to-face -face events are still on as of the date of this broadcast, with the Liberty Cup in Philadelphia on October 8th through 10th and the Carnage event in Vermont November 5th through 7th. Now, changes in COVID protocol may affect these tournaments, so please check out the links below for the most up-to-date information. And if you know of any other face-to-face -face opportunities anywhere throughout the world, please contact me at davidhood at dixicon.com so that I can announce it on the next Deadline News right here on DBM. Now, let's take a trip around the various websites and the YouTube channels for the content providers, which we call our DBN Media Partners. We'll start with the DiploStrats YouTube channel, which just dropped an episode featuring another of its highly popular diplomacy-themed puzzles. This one involving a situation in a France versus Austria two-player variant game from the 2020 WebDip World Cup. Then your next stop can be Florida Man's channel, which is also on YouTube, where he released a video discussing the Franco-German alliance to go along with his previous discussions of the EF, the EG, and the Western Triple options for the, for the Western alliance structures. And then finally, there's always the informative blog of Brother Board, who will actually appear later in this same episode of Deadline as part of the panel discussion. Brother Board recently wrote the seventh installment of his Solo Win series, this one entitled Make Friends, Then Choose Enemies. He suggests prioritizing ally building as the first step to a later solo push. Links to these particular items of dip content are found below. And you can also find a list of all of our DBN media partners at the North American Diplomacy Federation website, thenadf.org. While we're on the topic of how to achieve solo wins, which is the theme of this very deadline episode itself, and since it is high time we had more musical interludes on this show, let's cut to a completely sedate and completely not over the top number on the subject from some dude in a tuxedo. With apologies to Giacomo Puccini, but no one else. Nessuno tuo, nessuno tuo. Tu più rogiocatore nelle tue fredde stanze, guardi per denti che tremano per mancanza di speranza. Ma il mio mistero è nato solo in me, 
Il momento mio nessun sopra, no, no, e la verrò adesso la dirò, quanto la mia abilità splenderà. E la mia pugnalata spiogliererò il silenzio che rendo il tuo territorio mio. Alla fine vincerò, vincerò, vincerò. In other words, have confidence. Think you can win, and you might. Vincero! The Nexus Season 6 final for its extended deadline tournament has finally ended, with Ewok, otherwise known as Village Idiot, of British Columbia coming out on top playing Russia. It all came down to that last turn because there were paths for others to take a center to defeat Ewok, depending on the actions of the other players. Ewok blocked those paths by his careful diplomacy. There were significant twists and turns on this top board, which is one of the most deeply analyzed online games of all time, thanks to the full move-by-move -move coverage and post-game interviews available on the Diplomats YouTube channel. For more information on the Fatal Build Wave, the Ewok St. Pete screw-up, and the no-need-to-cover-Burgundy debacle, check out these YouTube videos at the list below. And now it's time for a segment we call My Favorite Things. We'll interview a diplomacy player about why that person likes playing a particular power or alliance on the board, and then we'll talk about something of particular interest to that hobbyist, whether or not related to diplomacy. This month, we check in on longtime Ontario diplomacy hobbyist Mike Hall and discuss his rather cool second hobby. Mikey Hall, welcome to Deadline. Thank you, David. Nice seeing you again. It's been forever. It has been a long time, although you and I have known each other for a very long time. Uh, Tell us. Yeah. Probably so back in 99. Probably. Yeah, that sounds about right. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Mikey, where you are, what you do, that kind of stuff. Okay. Presently, I live in a little town called North Bay, which is about four hours north of Toronto, um, kind of in the bush. And uh, I was an electrician working for the Navy for 26 plus years. I retired about eight years ago. And now I work for the provincial government, like your state government in the apprenticeship board. And have you always lived in Canada? Yeah, well, except for the times overseas, but yes, my family's always been here. Well, you mentioned your military background. Tell us what you did in the military exactly. I, I was an electrician, control system. Um, they gave me my training. It was a great opportunity. Uh, I got to travel the world. And uh, yeah, and uh, I got to play some diplomacy along the way. Let's talk about that. How did you get into diplomacy originally? Well, it was late 70s, early 80s. My brother, Jeff, 
I was big into war games, Avalon Hill games, and they were playing diplomacy quite often. And they hated taking turns reading orders. So uh, I didn't get to play, but I got to read orders for a while. And that's when I uh, started to learn the game. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. What what about the game bring keeps bringing you back? Oh, what keeps bringing me back? Well, yeah, I'd say yeah. it's the people. Uh, I first, when I first went to the Navy, we played a little bit of diplomacy on board, and then that died out. In the late uh, 90s, I guess, I found Manus Hand's uh, uh, diplomatic pouch. And then from there, I found the judges, and then I started playing. And then I got into real-time diplomacy where we sit down and play with uh, people at night online. And Roy Rink uh, that year said, hey, Mikey, why don't you come out to the East Coast? There's this thing called the World Board Gaming Championship in Hunt Valley, Maryland. I said, sure. Just run it. I had to run it by my wife. She says, go have fun. Um, so I went out there. And that's where I met you. Uh, Jim Yerke was running the tournament then. Awesome guy. Uh, I met Ike Porter, uh, DQ, uh, Satan, Pod, all these great nickname people. And uh, they made me feel welcome right off the bat. So I've been going back ever since. And uh, I even worked with Nathan Barnes and Matt Shields. And we ran uh, World Dipcon in Vancouver in 2007. And... Uh, I love the game, but I love the people more. Well, we love you too, Mikey. But we're here today to talk about not actually not diplomacy. In this segment of the show, we talk to a diplomacy hobbyist, but about something that may or may not have anything to do with the game. And in your case, I want to hear all about video games and pinball machines. Well, uh, being a, a kid of the late 70s, early 80s, uh, I spent my quarters and my evenings in an arcade playing pinball and video games. I've always enjoyed uh, playing them. Um, then I became an electrician uh, with the Navy. And over time, uh, I finally bought my first machine about 18 years ago. And I wanted to see what was under the hood. So uh, I opened them up and I learned how to fix them. And I've been doing it off and on uh, for about 18 years, but uh, mostly the last five years. And uh, I'm uh, really enjoying it. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Put my uh, my training to use, and I get to keep uh, with it. Well, show us what you're working on right now. Okay, what I'm working on right now is an old mid '70s pinball machine called Bronco. It is what we would call electromechanical. So up there, it's all reels. It's not digits, so it's not electronic. So that just means there's more moving parts. So this is what we call the, the play field. And uh, underneath the here is all the moving parts. So I'm gonna open it up, try to give you a look. So there we go, all the moving parts. And these are all contacts and relays that we use uh, to count the score. So this is what I have to go through when things aren't working is to find out where it's broken at. And also in the back is more stuff, more score reels and little movers and stuff that get all gummed up. So you have to clean that. Uh, tip, typically to overhaul a machine like this, this one I'm just starting, is about uh, 40 to 50 hours. So what we do is we take all the stuff off the play field and then we clean it and then wax it and polish it. And then, uh, yeah, move on to the next project. My other project I have here is an old sit-down arcade machine uh, that somebody wants fixed. It was broken, but instead of putting one game into it, we put 60. So what we do is we take out the big monitor screen, and we add in just a little circuit card. And then put a flat screen. So I got a new flat screen over here. Well what uh, a new used one that I'm going to install in there. So yeah, I uh, keep busy with this and, uh, oh, wait a minute, what did I, what do we got here? This is one I picked up on the way home from work today. That's the next project. Oh my. So yeah, 
I got a so nice what, what was the, what, on that sit down arcade game. What was the original game? Oh, what was it? I am not sure. Um, it's been gone through a few um, different games, but the one I'm putting in there will have Pac-Man, Miss Pac-Man, Galaga, Frogger, all those type of games in it. So 60 and one. And then I'm fixing that for a customer right now. Could you imagine in 1979 sitting down and having 60 games on the same screen? That would have been insane. I mean, oh, if you yes. asked, asked David Hood 1979, I, my head would have exploded. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, technology's come a long way. And, uh, yeah, people are happy, especially when they're sitting at home with COVID now or on a rainy day at the cottage. Uh, they have something to play. And that's what usually what I've been doing lately for all these people around North Bay, Sudbury and stuff is fix their old games or they buy them for uh, entertainment on rainy days. That's awesome. Yeah. So do you have an, uh, an arcade of finished games you're going to show us? Oh, yes, we do. Or I do. My wife likes to use the Royal Wii quite often. I get caught up in it. <laughs> so well, I'm just going to head outside and head to the basement. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then I will show you what I have going on. This is, uh, I usually keep about four or five uh, pinball machines at a time um, and then buy, sell, trade the other ones. This way uh, I don't clutter the basement and Mrs. Hall doesn't get upset. <laughs> so and let me, Mikey, let me ask you a question. In a, yeah. a non-COVID world, do you let people come over and play this stuff or do you just keep it all the oh, fun to yourself? When my son was younger, uh, he'd have friends over and they would play uh, the pinball machines and stuff and not touch the Xbox or the computer games. So I'm going to turn the camera around. And okay. I'll you. So here is a basement arcade. So I have four pinball machines right now. And sandwiched in between is a 1972 Seberg uh, jukebox that plays the old 45s. Good gracious. Yeah, little art decor here, movie posters. Um, and then old marquees from old arcade uh, machines. I, I built uh, light boxes for. And then, of course, every Canadian basement needs to have a hockey game. Oh, wow. Yeah, I used to and play. Then, on, I used to play on one of those. I remember that game right there. Yeah, and above it, I picked up this old Coke menu board. Oh, back in the in the spring, and I put up all the high scores for uh, the games there, and keep track of it. So, yeah. I, it does not look to me like you have missed any important details. Honestly, <laughs> in, in a in a basement arcade or a uh, that's just amazing. Okay, and here's the small board gaming collection I have. It's not as uh, in, uh, extensive as others, but uh, it's the games I like to play. That's oh, awesome. Yeah. Well, Mike, so, give us, yeah, Mike, give us some final thoughts on uh, your hobby that you just showed us, or the diplomacy hobby, or both. Uh, there are two very fun things I like to do. I like to play diplomacy, and I like uh, playing pinball in arcade. Um, you have to find what you like to do in life uh, and stick with it. it. makes you happy. It's not a bad thing. I think I speak for everyone in the hobby when I say that we really need a hall con where people <laughs> come to this, come to the room you're in, play pinball games, and play diplomacy in the same weekend. That just sounds like too much fun. Please run that by Mrs. Hall. Yes, I will. Uh, when I had my first house con back in, uh, oh, about 97, I had 18 strangers stay in my basement. <laughs> People I'd never met before. That's how I met Nathan Burns in the gang. So oh, man. It is possible. That's awesome. Well, we're looking forward to that. And thanks, Mike, for being on the show. All right. Good seeing you again. And look forward to seeing you uh, in November in Vermont at the World Championships. It'll be great. Carnage, here we come. Let's move now to our panel discussion about winning the game of diplomacy. The standard rulebook victory takes 18 centers. We all know how rare that occurs, though, at least in most modes of diplomacy play. Let's discuss why that is, what the consequences of that are, and how we can respond to it with the following panel of experienced hobbyists. 
longtime face-to-face -face player from Washington State, Matthew Krill, past World Dipcon champion Chris Brand from British Columbia, and Texas resident Blake, who's better known online as the diplomacy content creator, Brother Board. Welcome to Deadline, everyone, and thanks for giving us your insights about solos in the great game of diplomacy. Matt, let's start with you. Let's give some background about who you are, what you do, and how you got into the game. Okay. Well, a little bit about myself. I, I grew up in Colorado, but I've lived up here in the Pacific Northwest for about nine years with my wife and two daughters. Um, I'm a materials engineer within aerospace. And my diplomacy story started back in, in high school and college with house games in the Denver area and went to the 2001 DIPCON tournament, which I looked up, David, that you won that tournament. And we did share a board clear back then. But I, I returned back to press games in 2018 and came up to the Cascadia tournament in 2019 that Chris hosts. And just want to put in a plug for that tournament as well. You know, I didn't know a single person. And it was a very welcoming group and a great start to coming back to face-to-face -face play. And that's how I got back into it. So for a couple of years now. So I drove you out and then somebody else brought you back in. That's yeah. right. <laughs> it's good, good to know that, I, that, that that's the story. Chris, how about the same question for you? Um, so I, uh, I write software for a living. Um, but the more interesting part is... Um, I actually started playing diplomacy fairly young. My my dad actually owned the game. And I do remember trying a three-player game with myself and my dad and my brother that was absolutely horrible when I was in my probably preteen even. Um, then we used to have a group of us at school that used to play in the lunch hour. And it's quite impressive how much of a game you can get done in a lunch hour when you have like five-minute deadlines or something. So we used to have a, you know get a game reasonably well progressed in that time. Um, then at some point I was playing on email judges. Um, then I emigrated and I don't even remember how I came across. There was a tournament that Matt Hall was running down in White Rock that I saw was happening. So I just showed up on the day for that tournament and, uh, did fairly well. I think I soloed as Russia actually. <laughs> <laughs> that was in the early 2000s and basically I was hooked on the face-to-face -face scene since then so uh, I've since learned that there was a huge face-to-face uh, -face scene back in England that I missed out on completely but uh, um, yeah I guess I should mention the 2016 World's World Championship where I did fairly well in so <laughs> yeah you did better than the average bear better than anyone else I'd say <laughs> The audience will have seen an interview with Mikey Hall right before we, but they see this panel discussion. Oh, coincidentally, awesome. yes, coincid totally coincidentally. Excellent, brother. Brother Board, same question to you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in my day job, as it were, I'm a lawyer, like a lot of other diplomacy players, actually. And uh, I, although my career has increasingly gone in the direction of legal software development and business consulting, uh, but I still practice a tiny little bit. Uh, I started playing diplomacy back in, oh, it might have been 2007 or something like that, when a, a friend of mine who was in a club uh, that I was in at school introduced me to it, and I thought it was a fun game. And I added it. I eventually bought a copy and added it to my big shelf of games that I played once in a while. And uh, it wasn't until years later uh, that I started playing online. And uh, as my career as a, a law student and then in, uh, as a lawyer developed, I figured out that diplomacy was a really good online game uh, for passing the time. Since uh, if you play it online, a lot of times the games are drawn out over a, a long arc of time and you can access the game whenever it's convenient. So it's very good for a person who has a busy schedule. When I was a teenager, I played a lot of video games and uh, I still admire video games, but I don't really have the time to sit down and play a game for five hours a day or whatever it was that I played back then. And uh, as I played diplomacy more, I found myself um, spending a lot of time teaching other players how to play and uh, until eventually a few people that I know started really uh, 
bothering me to like write it down. Hey, your stuff you're saying is really useful. Maybe other people would benefit from it. And that led me to develop uh, my, my blog, which is like 95% geared towards teaching people how to be better at diplomacy. Well, speaking of which, let me stick with you and talk about the fact that a whole lot of diplomacy games that we play, nobody actually wins, at least according to the rule book. Why do you think that is? And is there anything we could do about it? <laughs> so the, the main reason why even a well-played game with no time limit or anything like that often ends in a draw is that the diplomacy map has a lot of choke points. It's a very constrained board map where it's easy to create defensive positions and not even that difficult to create an insurmountable position that we call a stalemate. And uh, once players have decided that they're going to stalemate, if they really want to do that and they stick to it, then the game is over and there's not a way for anybody to win. And so uh, experienced diplomacy players can see another person's win coming a long way off and uh, assemble the coalition that's necessary to block that player from winning. So in a, in a well-played game of diplomacy, if somebody wins, really wins by getting to 18 centers, that's quite an achievement. And somebody must have made a mistake or something, you know, down the line, because uh, most of the time players can prevent that sort of thing from happening. Then if you add in the fact that most uh, house games, leagues and tournaments have some limit, either a time limit or a turn limit, it makes the, the far-sighted kind of gameplay necessary to solo win even that much more difficult. And so you get something like, uh, even with no time limit, I think about half the games end in draws to probably much more than that uh, when you once you start taking into account turn limits. Sure. Matthew, I think long-term or long-time DBN viewers will know you from watching you uh, a couple of times pass up solo opportunities and then a couple of times seize those solo opportunities in past tournaments during the virtual era. Uh, walk us through your thought process on, on those. Yeah, so, you know, my main thought process when you're going through that is balancing that risk of going for a solo, um, which isn't always assured as his brother board was talking about, against kind of your long-term reputation. You know, so a lot of how I balance that risk is in the context of this year-long DB&I format instead of the tournaments just being standalone events. And so I think it's important to, you know, be a preferred partner on a board instead of being that early target and working to be a trustworthy ally to others is helped by having that, that reputation. And so I think that that's the, the risk there. Are you willing to stab a game long ally, even if you're not assured of it really working out for you? and having that affect your reputation. So, you know, I had, you know, that two-way drawn whipping, you know, that, you know, you're referring to. That was a case where I believe that even a solo wouldn't significantly change my final standings, and that was the first tournament of the year. So those two things really helped shape my decision about whether it was worth going for it or not. Um, whereas in Cascadia earlier this year, I knew I had to go for a solo if I was going to have a high finish to make that DB and I top group. And then there was that opportunity and, and less to risk to go for that. So my thought process really comes down to the tournament scoring methods, how we're looking at this overall virtual face-to-face -face arrangements when deciding about going for a solo. Makes sense. Chris, if anything, I would say that solos are even rarer in face-to-face -face tournament play than they are in online games. So are we not valuing solos enough somehow in face-to-face, -face, either through scoring systems or prevailing hobby wisdom or meta, or is there something else going on? Um, I do wonder whether that's true. I, 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 it'll be interesting to see the numbers for sure. <laughs> but uh, certainly there are some differences between face-to-face -face and the online formats. Um, I mean, one great example, uh, Brother Broad mentioned earlier, in Europe in particular, face-to-face -face games tend to be very time-limited. They'll, they'll often play to 1907, 1909, 1910, something like that. And it's much harder to get a solo in that time than it is if you've got an unlimited game or you're playing to 1914, 1918, something like that. So that's definitely a difference in Europe in particular. Um, and, you know, that, that's true in some of the tournaments in North America as well. Often there's a round that's time limited and nothing else. So people can get flights to get home and that kind of thing. 
Um, the other fact is, I think, I wonder if the, I think there's a difference with being physically present with people. I think we get a lot of information from other people, from body language and things like that. Um, maybe you get a more, closer relationships um, and that might make it a little bit, make you a little bit more reluctant to stare. Um, there's a bit of a closer bond maybe. Um, on the scoring system side, I, I don't think, I, I couldn't come up with anything. I don't think the scoring systems are making a difference there myself. Others might disagree, but that's my, my feeling. It's interesting. Staying with you, Chris, I sometimes worry that it is hard to promote to beginners a game like diplomacy where folk usually don't actually win in the rule book sense. Do you think that's an issue in terms of recruiting people into the game? Yeah, I do think it's an issue. Um, I'm not sure that it's the most significant issue, though. I, I My feeling is that the, the time length of the game and the fact that players get eliminated along the way. So you might have people playing for eight hours and someone's only playing for the first hour or something. I, I think those are more of a factor than the winning, particularly when you impose a scoring system. So even though you're not winning per the rule book, you've still maybe got to... You know, someone who's goes away saying, "Yes, I, I did better than everyone else." At least. <laughs> well, actually, Blake, let's let's talk talk about that with you for a minute. One way the hobby has dealt with the issue of there not being enough quote wins is to use the phrase "win the game" or "win the match" when what we really mean is top the board or have the most centers in a draw based system, as opposed to getting eighteen centers or a concession. What do you think about that accommodation as a way to promote? more winning in diplomacy? That's a, a fascinating linguistic question, which is the kind of stuff that I, I that that's intriguing. Uh, so I, I've had more than one person say something to me about my, my writings on solo wins who say, why do you have to say solo wins? Aren't those two words for the same thing? And uh, the answer is no, there's a lot of different ways to win diplomacy. Uh, and the strategies that win a time-limited tournament game or that win when you're just trying to top the board is not necessarily the same strategy that you need to follow if your goal is to get to 18 centers. And so I think that um, promoting tournament winning as a type of winning is a good way to help people feel like something is happening or that they're progressing or that they've accomplished something while playing the game well, we can still hold out the idea of a solo win as some, you know, a majestic achievement that's that rarely happens and is something to be appreciated and applauded, um, but not necessarily what the game is all about. Uh, now, not everybody wants to play that way, but that's okay. Uh, don't play in those tournaments where we where we score people for topping the boards. That's fine. Yeah, actually, uh, Govan, to you, Matthew, there are plenty of experienced hobbyists who actually think that a solo win on a board, uh, you know, that, that sort of um, mystical uh, goal that the brother board just mentioned actually means the play was bad instead of the play being good, because only poor play can result in a solo win, according to this way of thinking. Do you agree or disagree, or are you somewhere in the middle? I would say I generally agree with that. You know, I think there are exceptions, especially when you have two players racing across the board, trying for a solo, and they're both taking that that risk, you know, to get that top score. Um, however, what I think usually happens is that you have a diplomatic breakdown. You know, a player feels like they weren't being helped early enough to help hold off a solo bid, or they got stabbed while they're trying to hold the line against somebody. Or those type of things, I believe, are more commonly what gives somebody a solo and help, you know, basically gifted to it, I guess, because of how they treated somebody or how somebody on the other side handled things. So in general, I do believe that a board should be able to stop a solo attempt if, you know, and that's what good play is. It's almost like you're saying that player interactions and player dynamics are more important in the game than the actual moves is almost what I hear you say. I, I think they are. Absolutely. All right. Well, putting aside those issues, Matt, let's talk strategy and tactics. What is the most important advice you think you could give someone on how to achieve a solo win? Well, I guess I'm going to repeat myself a little bit. You know, I think maintaining your diplomatic ties and your friendships on a board 
are your best tools instead of just relying on tactics to get across the stalemate lines or to be the one that's benefiting from smaller janissaries in the end game. Um, you know, diplomacy, as we know, is a very emotional game. And people obviously know if you've been actively trying to help them uh, succeed in the game, if you've been treating them fairly in the game, even if they're on the opposite side of the board. And I do believe that those are the most important tools you know, towards achieving a solo win. Chris, what do you think the ideal board circumstances are for a solo in terms of alliance structure or overall diplomatic environment or any other factors that work in favor of the soloist? Um, first of all, I, I agree with everything Matt said. Um, when, when people who don't know the game ask me about diplomacy, I always say it's about convincing the other people to let you win. So there's seven players in the game. Ultimately, you've got to convince six of them that you should be the person who wins that game. Um, so it does all come down to this emotional stuff. And being the person that other people like the most or that, you know, if I can't win, then I'd rather Chris did than anyone else is my is the ideal position for me to be in. Um, you've also got to look at different people's philosophies of the game, particularly it, when you realize that this isn't your game, this isn't the game you're going to win, this isn't the game you're going to be top on, what are your secondary goals there? Um, and some people, it's, oh, I, I don't care where I end up as long as so-and-so who stabbed me earlier dies. That's perfect for you because that's that, those are the people you want in the game, right? If you've got three of those, then you're sorted. Right? <laughs> um, the other thing that's worth mentioning is even if everyone is working against you to stop your solo, they're still in the back of their minds they're not they're also thinking beyond the solo some of them are anyway some of them will, will just have that short term okay we stop the solo and then once that's happened we'll worry about that later but some of them are thinking once we stop this solo i need i want to be doing best at that point I think, uh, i'd like to to contribute to this conversation with a piece of advice that's tactical and another that's psychological so I think that to, to create a game state that facilitates a solo win, you want to position your pieces where it will be difficult for the other players to understand how to form the stalemate line that will stop you from winning. And so uh, I've had a lot of my solo wins be stopped because the 15 or 16 supply centers that I had were all on one side of the stalemate line. And I had solo wins that were almost impossible to stop because I had three centers that were on the other side of the stalemate line when I began, even though my total might only have been 11 or 12. And so uh, the more you can distort the game state from the usual stalemate lines that people are familiar with, the better your chances of being able to outplay them, even if they unite against you. This leads into the second piece of advice I have, the psychological one, which uh, loops into what Matt said. Uh, about the players and how they think, and also your topic, uh, your idea about, or the the, com the conventional wisdom about players needing to make a mistake. And this advice is create a situation that allows people to make mistakes. And that tactical situation I described is an example of that, but you can also spring the psychological trap. Things like tempt players into backstabbing their beloved allies so that they become angry and want to throw you a solo win. You can do things to induce those situations and those psychological conditions that will make people um, do the things that are necessary for you to solo win. So even though they need to make a mistake, uh, you can do things to cause them to make those mistakes. I think that's good advice. You also wrote a piece on your blog recently about a way to achieve a solo is to embrace what makes your particular power you're playing different from a different power. In other words, when you're playing Italy, there are things about playing Italy that you should embrace if you're trying to solo versus playing Russia versus playing England. Could you expand on that just a, just a little bit? Sure. Uh, this is something that to an experienced diplomacy player may seem uh, kind of obvious, but to beginner or uh, middle level experienced players, they may not appreciate how intrinsically different the powers are. And this is usually a product of their geography. So for instance, uh, the power Germany is the only power that has five neighbors. All other powers have four or fewer. 
So this re makes it really, really important that you have a conversation with as many powers as possible when you're Germany. To play Germany well is a very political game or like lowercase d diplomatic. Whereas if you're a power like Turkey, you only have three neighbors, it may be enough to just have them not attack you. As long as they don't unite and come against you, you could be okay diplomatically. And instead focusing on building up tactical momentum since you're a corner power, uh, could be a a better use of your time when you're playing as Turkey. Play defensively, don't get eliminated, and maybe later I'll have a breakthrough and, and get a good result. And so on. With each of the different powers, they have strengths and weaknesses. Russia's got ports on both sides of the stalemate line. you got to use that to your advantage if you're really going to win. Uh, Italy's rarely attacked in the beginning. That's really cool. How can you use that to your advantage? The same isn't true about Austria. So you know, the, the, the strategy you may follow as Italy and Austria, even though they're so physically close to each other, could be completely different to play those powers well. Sure. Chris, tell us your final thoughts about uh, getting a, a solo in the game of diplomacy. Um, I think it's important to remember that you're not going to solo if you don't try to. Um, and you need to be thinking of that pretty much every turn, right from the start. You need to be you need to have that in your mind of how, what should I be doing, not just in the short term, but in order to get, set things up so that I can solo. A, a lot of the stuff that uh, Brother Broad was talking about earlier with cultivating that, uh, those broad circumstances that you want. Um, and, you know, that might just be as simple as grabbing the dots over the far side of the stalemate line before the ones on the near side of the stalemate line. So you're in a better tactical position to grab those last three or four or five centers or whatever it is, or it might be, um, manipulating people's emotions on uh, around the board so that you're they, you're the person they like and someone else they don't like. So, yeah. Well, I've said it many times that you you will fail to solo a hundred percent of the time that you don't try. Right. Hundred percent. Honestly, if you take one thing away from this, that's what I would say is take away. Yep. Matt, how about you? Give us some give us some some really good insights here. Uh, yeah, there's a budding soloist out there. You want the pet talk on the wins, the whys, and the hows. Give it to them. Yeah, so I believe anybody listening has that ability to solo. Um, my belief is it really starts with practicing being a predictable partner on the diplomacy board. That gives you the best chance to reach that end game and still have a good relationship with your other players, which is uh, the key in my mind. And from this position, you're most likely to be across the stalemate lines where you can weigh those risks and go for that solo when you get a good opportunity. Yeah, that's good advice. All right, Blake, I'm going to give you the final word. What one thing about solos have we not talked about yet that the audience needs to hear? That in the end game, when you're trying to decide how to move your pieces, most players are not deciding their movements randomly, but according to the same patterns they use to pick their moves in general. And so when you're trying to get those final guesses in, think carefully about how you've seen that player play before. Are they careful and methodical? Do they take big risks? Are they ever willing to do a crazy move that just might pay off? And if you can incorporate that into your thinking, you stand a much higher chance of winning those last few guesses that you're gonna need to win. That's great advice, Brother Borg. Great advice, Matt. Great advice, Chris. And thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Dave. All right. Thanks for having us. And thanks to all of you watching at home. We hope you have enjoyed this broadcast of Deadline. If you have news, ideas for features, or feedback of any kind, please feel free to send an email to info at diplobn.com or you can drop me a line directly at davidhood at dixiecon.com. For all of our other broadcast offerings, visit our website at diplobn.com. This is David Hood signing off. I wish you brightness and bliss and, of course, Belgium.